Thank you so much for having me. Um, okay. Um, so just a little bit of background on me. So I'm a community builder that fell into technology and I've been building for about nine years in technology. And once I fell into tech, I really loved the potential. Um, so my background's in sustainable development and there are so many issues around how we create change in the world and change in the communities and how we start to mobilise people and um, get people active and caring. And as soon as I fell into technology, it was like, ah, oh, this is how we do it. This is how how we start to connect and replicate and, and network things. Um, and so last year, I found myself unemployed. Um, the company that I was working for closed and I had a baby. So this is my second, so it's not quite so horrendous because the first is awful, but the second. <laughs> In terms of all the, if you, yeah, yeah. Um, but so this is, so this is, so second time around, it's all a lot easier um, and you have time to think about things. So I've kind of had 18 months off to think about things and to, to think about um, the sorts of things that I'd like to do and, and um, how, reflecting on how I use technology and, and how I, I think we should be using technology or could be using technology. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm going to share with you is a, is a bit of a project that we created through Twitter um, and I'm going to talk about, talk about that and how it had impact. Um, and the thing that I really love about technology and especially open source, which is what I build in, is it's been built on this foundation of um, inclusion, although there are definitely um, a, a bunch of issues around inclusion as far as um, gender and things like that, but the premise of open source is about having free and open access to information, that the code base is free, that anyone can participate. Um, and so that one of the areas that um, open source is going through at the moment is kind of a community evolution. So we're at this point where a lot of these open source tools have been built and I build in Drupal. Um, so this is something that's really happening within that open source community where the community has evolved and those people that built the tools are at a certain level where they don't need to be the ones that are coding and, and doing all the learning. They're now the mentors and the leaders. Um, and so for that community, in particular, it's about how do we reposition those people that are leaders as leaders and mentor in new generations. Um, and some of the conflict that's kind of happening for people to be able to find their place within community, I think, is sort of coming from those dynamics. Um, and so 18 months ago, I really found myself also disconnected from the broader Drupal community as well. Um, so for me, this journey has also been about reconnecting with developers, finding out what's going on, um, using Twitter, using Slack, using social media for that. Um, and that's, that's, been, that's been really interesting. Um, I just wanted to share a really amazing podcast. Um, they're just in their second week and it's uh, called Pretty for an Aboriginal. Um, and I was listening to this on the plane yesterday and they were talking about representation and, and why representation matters, um, why storytelling matters and why having people that you're looking to and, and forging um, a path matters. And it's just such a connected theme of everything that we're talking about today. Um, so I really encourage people to check this podcast out because it's great. Um, so we're in technology and I'm like thinking about the future and thinking about what we're doing next and I, I, I started to pick up Twitter and get really involved in Twitter and one of the things I really noticed really early on was the number of women especially that were amazing and on Twitter and underemployed and just totally underutilised and I'm like there are so many amazing people but at women especially um, that, are on, that are on Twitter and um, you know what if we start to connect them and, and create projects and get people involved um, and then I sort of you know is, is this just me is this is other people also feeding into this um, and so this is one if I apply for a job and say I've got a network of tech and non-tech people that want to change the world will y'all back me up and within a day I got like 49 likes which is heaps for me um, <laughs> but it's like really like a 49 people and then all the people that you know and you know that's just starts to you start to really create networks of scale and difference and change and I just find that so exciting um, I was at a, a hacker festival last month um, and someone said to me that at 40 hackers have midlife crises crises because they realize that they're not going to change the world <laughs> so we've also got like this generation of there's like this age generation and I've had to realize that I'm kind of 
in my late in my mid to late thirties in that tier of of people that now have a responsibility to support the next generation through and to support new people through and and new women through, um, and so there's a level of responsibility around that and of around where where my place fits within that, um, and the same with those people that are in their forties. It's not over yet. Um, <laughs> you can be you can be involved still, <laughs> which I find really exciting. Um, and this is uh, this. So I work. I live in a rural community. Um, so while I'm thinking about inclusion for technology, it's also about how we engage rural communities and how we bring them with us. Because as jobs change and we create the digital divide, those are areas where people are really going to be locked out. Um, and so that's that's really really important to me. Um, yet at the same time, we still have this this disconnect between people that actually the volumes of people that use technology and can actually engage with it. Um, and I really liked this quote where someone saying that um, she got picked for um, registration election judge training because she had high technical proficiency could use an iPad um, <laughs> and that's you know within within not just rural Australia but also a lot of you know a lot of our cities as well we are we are bringing people along for change and talking to them about this changing world when really their level of technical proficiency is actually incredibly low now that doesn't mean that they're not interested in learning and engaging and getting involved um, and so one of the ways that I think we can do that is to start to create projects that give people exposure, that open the doors for people to get involved in, in technology. Um, and so for technologists, I think, you know, often, often coming from a really um, kind of tender-driven environment or here's a proposal, this is the solution that we as an organisation want to give you as a developer, um, it's, it's, it's kind of restricting because you don't get to give your version of how you think these tools should be used. Um, and so as technologists, we can think about the how. We can think about how would we do it? Like, how do these tools fit together? How can we use them in the best way? Um, and so that's been something that I've really been, really been starting to think about a lot. Um, and so um, on December 30 last year, um, I'd been watching this issue simmering in so on social media and in news articles. Um, and so the, there were people that were reporting that they were having issues with debts from Centrelink. And there were people that hadn't been on Centrelink for five or six years. And for some people it was, for a lot of people, they were just getting calls from debt collectors. So they weren't sure where this was coming from. Um, and so I'm going to talk about this campaign and to give you like the brief summary, the outcomes from this so far have been that um, we've had the campaign itself has led to $8 million in false debts being revoked in New South Wales alone. Um, and then just last week, I think it was, um, we, they, they released um, figures for the Senate inquiry that was subsequently held where we had 20,000 debts that have been written down um, across Australia. And so that's just to March 31. And they're just official debts that have gone through the process. There are still people stuck within this system. Um, so the level of change that of the project that I'm going to talk through to you about, um, it, you know, it really, it's created big numbers and, and big impact. So this was the start. So this was the start of what we were starting to see um, on on Facebook. On sorry, on Twitter and Facebook, were people talking about um, complaints around fraud accusations and and not not knowing where these were coming from. Um, so I started to see this, and I was like, I think there's a campaign in this. I think if we can connect people and talk about this, um, there's what's going on. You know, where where's this coming from? Fortunately, um, on December 30, we had this headline, bludgers and imaginary debt, what the hell is happening with the latest Centrelink clusterfuck? <laughs> <laughs> Sign language that, um, <laughs> and so you know you've got a campaign when you start to see the media talk about, you know, talk about talk about this, um, and so for me, it's, for me, knowing how to use tools to build and and being interested in how we start to engage people, um, it was 
I knew the, what I could contribute to it, but I certainly didn't have the agency or the reach to be able to um, create, uh, to be able to get volunteers to get involved, and that was the intent of the project. Um, and so as far as trying to figure out what was happening from a digital rights point of view and from, an, um, from the, the, the obvious error that was going on with the algorithm and the, um, where, this, where this error was coming from, um, if anyone's on Twitter, then Asha Wolf is probably someone that you follow or that you that you recognise. Um, so she was someone that I um, started to message about building a website, um, and I didn't. We didn't know each other, um, but I but I knew that she was really passionate about these issues, and that um, people that followed her cared about these issues, and would be able to create that broad dialogue. So it was, let's build a website. Um, and I just said, look, I'll, I'll do it. It'll be flexible. We'll do it in a really open way. Um, we'll use Drupal so that we can have that expandability. Um, we ended up using a distribution that the government created because that kind of made the site build easier and it was a little bit ironic. Um, <laughs> but also what, I, what the intent was and what we ended up doing was training people as they learned about the project, we would open up ways for them to start to participate. Um, so using something like GovCMS, which is now what the government builds all their federal sites in and states and um, a lot of other areas also build in, there are jobs that are going to be, that are available for people to use those platforms. And if you know how to use those platforms, then you're going to have access to those jobs. Um, and so the, the purpose was that we weren't going to know the extent to this if people didn't collectivise and start, and start talking. So Amy at the top here, she, she sends a tweet and says, I've got no skills to offer apart from proofreading. Probably not useful, but I'd share the shit out of this. So anyone that does website stuff knows that it's all about content. So to find someone that's saying, I'll proofread your content, I um, was like, hello. <laughs> and she's still um, heavily involved in, in this and heavily involved in, um, in the Facebook management and the submissions to our inquiry. And she hadn't had exposure to a content management system before and she manages all the content on our site. So we've got over six or 700 news items through it we've got uh, 500 stories that are um, that have been shared and she's the best content manager that I've ever worked with um, so this is someone that didn't have that exposure to technology would have and has now you know had all these just through some training and some access and using using this in a really functional way she is now infinitely employable and I would recommend her to anyone um, <laughs> and so this is the site that was created so this is this is not my dad um, and even the so right from the start it was firstly let's let's lock down a hashtag talk to Asha what sort of hashtag you know what are our hashtag options pull that together choose something that works that became the focal point for the campaign that became the the thing that we um, connected conversation to and tracked conversation with people that wanted to talk about it they had this hashtag it was incredibly important um, the design stuff was just um, someone that just started creating, doing design work for us um, because there were a lot of people that were really interested in this and they had agency because they were no longer involved with Centrelink but people still really care about our social support system um, and it's a really, you know, it's a really important part of what makes Australia great is that we have, um, we have these structures in place. Um, I certainly would never have been able to go to university without Centrelink um, and so even though I didn't get a debt personally it's quite offensive to me that we would start to erode this through the use of poor technology that looks at automation of these government systems without oversight or understanding the consequences and then not coming in and fixing them when it's made blatantly obvious that there are severe and critical flaws. Um, and this is where government will continue to go with algorithms and use of data because there's money saving and there's business driving it and, and the, it, these, are, these are quite critical issues um, that, that communities all around the world are actually facing. Um, and so we need tech and non-people to connect and be a part of understanding the implication and, and being a part of um, the, the conversation and the solution. 
Um, so these were the sort of the three things that we had to pull it together. We had the hashtag, we had the website, um, and we had Slack. And um, so as people started to be interested in it, we would use Google Docs and I'd say, you go ahead and do this. Like, write the People would just offer to write certain bits of the content that we needed. They'd get all, of, someone got all of the legal information from all of the websites. And we really built content organically. And when people were interested, we invited them into our Slack and we still continue to maintain a core of people that are really active on the campaign. Um, most of them are women and most of them are from rural communities as well. So again, we were able to break down those gender and geographical divides by bringing in people that happened to be, that were enthusiastic and, and talking about this. And by and large, the active ones were women. Um, and so uh, as we're doing this and Ash is tweeting and we're uncovering all this conversation, there's also other, um, other people start and organisations start to see how they can be involved in this conversation. Um, and so this is uncoordinated. People are just seeing the opportunity and they're seeing the part that they, they can play and the conversation's so broad that, um, that they, people feel invited to participate and, and get involved. So there was the honest government advert, which I think it was like five million views, maybe even so much more. Um, and so people are creating content and that content's getting shared. Um, I had someone that just started sending me like these amazing memes. Um, so Mrs. Madge Smith gets a not my debt letter. Fuck Madge, 20,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and someone sent me this, which I just love. Oh, look, Alice, it's one of them not my debt fellows. They told us about them at the LMP lodge meeting. Don't ever go near one of them. <laughs> Dangerous women. Um, and so I just get, like, people would send me memes and information and people were talking about the breaking down the algorithm and breaking down the policy and going through Hansard and finding where this came from. And um, it sort of became like a... A, a puzzle, like how did this policy get created? What are the effects of this? Um, someone took on the role of doing freedom of information um, uh, call outs to try to unpick the policy and, and where that had come from. And by talking about that so visually and tweeting about it so visually, we started to build this understanding for people that anyone can access their freedom of information stuff and you should be asking for it and you should be doing it from a personal level but also from an operational level. Um, we have the right to ask for these things. We have the right to use these institutions that are in place to support us um, that really wasn't in place and that evidence wasn't clear for people which was part of the, the problem with the system. So this is a small town, a small country town, where someone just started creating these amazing posters and putting them up in bus shelters in this like conservative small country town and then tweeting about this. Um, again, all happening organically. Um, there was a Senate inquiry, <laughs> and so we we created um, we created material for, for to share with organisations. So about thirty organisations, um, legal aid organisations, and the big social service peak organisations nationally and within each state came together because they now had to respond to the community concerns that were being raised about this issue. Um, and so, you know, we just got this amazing art from an anonymous person that just got involved and wanted to, wanted to share this stuff with us. It also spilled out into the streets, so people were um, protesting in Parliament. These people did not hear about this campaign through Twitter. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, but through but through the other through the other stuff, as this as as unions and and politicians started to talk about this in the community, um, they could see how this was going to affect them. So this is them being affected by a government algorithm that's very technical, and you know people are still getting their heads around explaining the tech, but they can see that this is going to be affecting them as well. Um, this is, uh, sorry for the angle, um, but this is the public trustee, so this is people with a disability um, that have their um, finances um, covered by the public trustee. They just started paying it. So people lost agency to even go and, and say this debt wasn't theirs and it just started, started getting paid. Um, so again, they started speaking out. 
One of the core functions that we put onto the site, um, which sort of blew me away that we, we got so much response. I was sort of hoping for 20 stories to be submitted. Um, and so this on the, on the left is sort of the 18th of Jan. Everything slowed down um, with a lot of this action. But now we're up to 586 stories that have been shared on the site, which represents a, a total of, of um, $3.8 million worth of debt. What we actually know is New South Wales alone, it's actually $12 million worth of debt. So we had these amazing numbers that still didn't actually touch the surface of, of what was happening. Um, but what we had was 580. 86 stories in people's own words anonymously submitted that talked about the effects of this on them in the community. People that were literally choosing between food and rent and paying this debt and trying to navigate through this system. Um, so I've got to I've got to kind of wrap up, but um, yeah. So these are just tweets that talk about the people talking about getting rid of their debt. Um, so this person had an eight thousand dollar debt wiped away with a quick apology, no detail. You know, one day they've got eight thousand dollars in debt, one day they haven't. Again, this person has um, only basic, basically computer illiterate. So using these services is a challenge. Let alone all of the other um, administrative burden that happens around that as well um, and we again we talked we got people to submit to a senate inquiry because these are the systems that we have in place through our government and we have to educate people in, in how to work with those systems um, and we submitted a, a, a to the inquiry as well and I, I would think I'll just leave on this one. Um, but what we did was use technology and social media to create a really a conversation that maintained positivity and inclusivity. And I really like this one. Not My Debt has actually shown the power of social media as a tool for advocacy, community engagement and community support. Um, and that's, you know, it's a nice way to use Twitter when we always talk about the negativity and the exclusion that can happen with technology technology and social media. Um, so it was, it was really as distressing as some of the outcomes were, there was this positivity um, of the community coming together and to support people that were vulnerable through this um, and to use their agency to uncover um, this quite critical issue. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, what can we do uh, be, being part of the tech industry in general, what can we do to get involved other than just simply jump in? Is there um, other networks out there that we can um, either access or specific um, other avenues that you have or that you can advise us of? For this sort of project or projects generally? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Community engagement is 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 tough, um, and people are having, you know. Yeah, community, community engagement is tough. What we learnt through this is that it is about opening, giving permission for people to get involved. Um, and so providing the tools and giving people training in how to use those tools. Um, it's something that we can do as technologists is to try to ensure that people and organisations get the right tools. Um, because the wrong tools are really costly and the, the impacts of, um, of, there are still lessons to be learned by trying things. Um, but this stuff does take community management and we shouldn't be underestimating that level of community management. Um, and certainly, I think while we're having this conversation about how exciting social media is and these tools are, um, there are, we are still lacking, um, we're still lacking tools that communities can pick up and use for this sort of advocacy. And I think that's one of our next steps is, is what we build, um, how, we, how we empower communities. And it's, it's an ongoing thing. But communities that I that I um, talk to really understand that technology is part of the future, um, and it's part of the future for their regeneration as well. So communities themselves are open and interested um, in in um, becoming involved in community projects through that way. Um, so so yeah, I think it's a little bit of a watch this space, but it is critically important to keep keep an eye out for opportunities and openings in responsive communities. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, any more? No, another round of applause for Lindsay, please. <laughs>